Do bumblebees, which are said to be physics defying, use gravity, gravity control to fly? Or are there other examples of gravity control happening in nature? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's a documentary that was- I'll bring up Andrew. Go ahead. Yeah, there was a documentary that was just done uh, about cavitation. Um, and let's see, it was a scientist in Russia that was, um, oh my God, what is the name of that field of expertise for bugs? Um, can't remember. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm having a senior moment. Is a scientist studying bugs? It's like ichthyology. Like yeah, or something like that. Uh, and and he found that some of the um, patterns, hexagonal patterns of certain beetles, um, you know, on their wings, produced lift that was anomalous. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and um, he, uh, he published this, um, got in a lot of trouble for it. Uh, but uh, supposedly made a device that was a little platform you could levitate on. Um, and um, that there's videos in in that little documentary of some of these wings kind of levitating. And um, it's really interesting. Um, so there's as well, more modern experiments that were done about cavitation, you know, uh, using certain geometry in some cases, electromagnetically producing these uh, cavitation like uh, the experiments by uh, John Hutchinson and so on. So, yeah. um, you know, maybe bumblebees are cavitating space-time, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I like to think of them as little space-time cavitators. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, the physics there, um, you know, is clearly not able to be defined by the standard model. However, in the model I'm writing right now, it has its place, but and I would have to finalize those equations to be able to tell you exactly how much lift they get from space time <laughs> cavitation. But I, uh, I don't have those equations right now. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, I was sitting in the garden the other day just watching them kind of go up and to the side and to the other side. And the movement looked like a UFO. And so that's where the thought came from. What really brought up the question for me is that if, if the equations that you're writing and the physics that you're doing, everything points toward looking toward nature, for the solution of our problems. And I'm wondering if some of the quote, lesser forms that already exist on this planet are using the systems that will become uh, more readily apparent and available when the equations become known. I think so. I think there's uh, implications to things that animals do and uh, plants that are going to become more understood and more obvious because we'll have a better understanding of the exchange of energies and the energetic you know uh information of a system so we'll understand better maybe things like um how birds orient themselves on whales and so on um, relative to the magnetic field of the earth and all this or um, other ways um, you know what kind of senses how senses are developed to filter or to tune to a certain electromagnetic frequency for instance a vision or 
or of smell and so on. So, you know, there's all kinds of things in nature, I think, are going to become more uh, clearly understood. And certainly um, the codependence or the coupling that you see in nature between all species, which is currently not well understood and explained. Um, or for instance, in, in biological systems, cell, cell differentiation, meaning like how do cells know to differentiate? How do they know to make a liver, a, a heart, a brain? You know, like how, where's the information coming from that's defining how things should develop? From these new equations, this will become clearer and or at least will have a mechanism for understanding how, you know, the, the system cell, you know, from the feedback, the system self-organize into more complex um, uh, behaviors and how they couple all the way down to the atomic level. So the ultimate part of its uh, power is to output why the system would become self-aware, which is basically the ultimate feedback, um, you know, of the biological evolution. So that the, all of a sudden the biology, you know, is able to be self-aware. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny because from what I was saying earlier, that self-awareness has a really big challenge, right? That it's very dangerous that the, the little biological entity, when they become self-aware, would think that it's separate from, every, from the thing that made it. Um, you know, that it's, it's uh, divided from the rest of the, you know, it's like the little metronome not realizing that it's coupled, you know, to the table underneath it, right? Um, and that somehow the fact that all the other metronomes are ticking just at the right time so that the whole thing works, um, that that somehow happened randomly, which which is not possible. It, it has to be coupled to do that. So when the, the, the little entity that became self-aware because of feedback of realizing its own existence, it's really critical that shortly thereafter it realized that that, that feedback is happening everywhere um, because it's coupled and that like, you know, we emerged from this fundamental feedback of information in order for our world to be sustainable, uh, it has to harmonize with that feedback. Yeah. And definitely biology currently on our planet is giving us a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, people yeah, yeah, don't realize, for instance, um, what's happening with uh, magnetic anomaly in the South Hemisphere currently the movement of the poles of the magnetic poles and so on and there's you know we have a limited amount of time to get the job done um and it's critical we get yes. it done soon thank you yes. well, we're, we're doing all we can. thank you andrew thank you for being here andrew thanks for bringing in the you. The bumblebee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Take care.